and not going to the details of my own work, but uh, how, how it could, could affect uh, could affect international conflict. And then I was reading this um, uh, this, uh, this book of, by political scientists uh, about uh, uh, the measures of conflict that we have the correlates of war projects. It's a major project by political scientists and collection data about international conflict. And we found that Quincy Wright was the father of that project. So, so basically, the Corridor War Project, and, and there is a one, and in this book they say, well, Sewer Wright, the genetics, was teasing his brother because they said, I'm a serious scientist, I'm a geneticist, I use real data, I use experiment. You are an international lawyer, you are an international relations scholar, you, don't, you just talk about these things, but you don't have data. Then Quincy Wright started to collect an empirical report in the 1940s and 50s that led to this. So, so here, uh, then I, I wrote a paper with my brother Warren Readers that had data generated from Quincy Wright using genetic distance that was sewer right, using instrumental variable of a field right, I said, well, the right, and then, and then, then I said, this is really all about, about siblings and, and families, and in fact, we also found that the wars are much more likely between populations that are closely related to each other, so that it's, the war itself is a story about, you know, sibling rivals. So all this uh, just to illustrate uh, how uh, deeper uh, there has been the influence, I think, on so many different branches of, uh, uh, you know, of science and, and, and social sciences and, and biological sciences by uh, this family. So now we are extremely honored uh, to have two members of the family who will uh, talk uh, specifically about uh, Philip uh, Green Wright as, as, as their grandfather. Uh, we will have uh, um, uh, uh, Rosalind Wright in Paris and uh, uh, Theodore Wright, who are going, uh, who are going to talk about, um, about uh, Philip Green Wright. Uh, and, uh, in fact, uh, Professor Wright, Professor Theodore Wright, is uh, a political scientist and is, uh, uh, like his uncle, uh, which is the son of Theodore, I understand. And, uh, and Rosalind uh, Wright Harris was, uh, for many years, I understand, the president of an NGO that dealt with international relations. And so, uh, so there is, uh, again, a connection with international relations and with political science, uh, and uh, also given the importance of international relations and thoughts, so that's also another, another very interesting uh, connection. So uh, now I would like to give uh, the floor now for the rest uh, of the event uh, uh, to uh, Rosalind Wright Harris, first and then to the other right, and then we'll have some uh, remembrances uh, about uh, their uh, Rosalind 
in the humanities. Nevertheless, his own degree at Tufts in 1884 was in civil engineering, and his MA at Harvard was in economics. Uh, there was a classmate of William Osgood, whose grandson Theodore is in our audience. One of his poems from the book The Dreamer, Galesburg, the Asgard Press, that was the basement press, uh, 1906, is called The Teacher, which I think is quite autobiographical and expresses his discouragement in this period of his life, which led him courageously in 1912 to resign his secure position at Lombard and return at the age of 51 to graduate school at Harvard and study of economics. In this poem he wrote, Today in Horace, many aims, a bright girl, but impertinent and somewhat lacking, as I think, in application, blundered in rendering the gerund. Twas the very thing which I drilled the class the day before. So I admonished her. I said it was her duty while at college to study and to pay attention in her classes, that she should not waste her time in idle pleasures, frivolous, frivolous delights, and social uh, dissipations as she did. In a small college like that, the professors knew what the students were doing. <laughs> uh, close application, he said, is the price of sure success. And she, for she is bold and saucy because her father is a wealthy man, perhaps, and she supposes that the college would like to get his money, looked pertly up and said, Professor, I suppose that you were always attending in front of a boy? Someone laughed. I wondered what it meant. At first, it seemed an idle, witless jest. For had I not been diligent, had I not ranked first in my class, and had I not success? Success. The price of sure success. Why did they titter? Can it be? never came into my mind before, but can it be my students whom I teach and give wise counsel to, and who I thought with all their willfulness looked up to me and held my learning in some reverence, that they, my students, pity me, a poor old man content to gnaw the husk of life while others eat the corn. As one whose life is all in half tones, neutral, colorless, without highlights of blues or crimsons, one who shrinks from the fierce joy of struggle, where fair in the open field men meet with men, man fashion, one too timid to stake his life upon a cast and win or lose. Do they reason well, thinking perhaps, when I admonish them the diligence and self-restraint application to our books, lead to success like his, then I won't follow the advice. Yes, I can answer Minnie's question. Yes, I was ambitious from a boy at college, and for my teachers uttered then the same wise saws I uttered to my classes. I believed them and was studious and docile. I got my lessons thoroughly and had no time for frivolous amusements with the boys. Uh, made few acquaintances, I could not be distracted from my present duty, and my reward came, for I led my class at Tufts and was assigned a valedictory. Within a year from that commencement, I was offered the position which I hold today. It was not much, I thought, the chair of classics, in women classes, of course, in a struggling Western school it would serve as a stepping stone, perhaps to something higher. Forty years had passed. Boys that I knew at college and despised for idleness have somehow grown, expanded, sounded like steps and shallows, and upborne upon us current have attained to posts of honor, wealth, and prominence, all of the world in its rude rule of thumb. Oh, 
success. And, uh, and poor boys whom I taught and helped through college have moved forward, filled their lives with deeds, and now are married and are rich and prosperous. And I am where I was. Once I had an offer, but this college founded to spread my faith, I then had learned to love and would not leave. Was it well? Is it success to pluck and eat? And is it empty folly to deny oneself the press restrain as I have ever done? They say that all my students love me. That's something. Well, I took this place. I thought it was a stepping stone to something higher. Perhaps it is. Though I am old and gray and life flows swiftly past, and on my feet will scarcely tempt again its flood. I wait the master's summons. Ah, he will explain. I'm going to stop in my meditations. It's late, and I have 20 exercises to correct, and then I go to rest. End of poem. But that was not to be the end of the story. We know from the main speeches this meeting that Philip Wright escaped Lombard and entered a whole different stage of life with greater rewards and satisfactions in Cambridge and Washington. This poem inspired me to leave Little Bates College in 1965 for the new State University of Albany and to become, I hope, one of the experts in the study of Muslims in India long way off from what we've been talking about here. Uh, Philip's love of poetry inspired his most notable student, Carl Sandberg, to write poetry to a place uh, for a place in all the anthologies of American poetry, but with a style of poetry far different from his mentors.
uh, so you can brief the full chat around. And for the right family, I have tokens for you and the speakers so that you for the party. Don't, don't forget to pick them up from behind. Thank you.